Well, I, I guess we could get started. So I'll pass it over to Ollie. Ollie, go ahead. Okay. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the first of five workshops in our Creative Accessibility Series. We are grateful to Janelle Shaw, the Executive Director of the Arts Accessibility Network of Manitoba, for her guidance in partnership to bring you this series of workshops. I'm Arlie Ashcroft. I'm Métis. I'm the Indigenous Programs Coordinator at Creative Manitoba. And together with Janelle, we will be bringing you a series of five workshops. Tonight is going to be a panel discussion on accessibility in the arts. Uh, June 12th is Breaking into the Music Scene with Nick Dyson. June 19th, No Labels Please with E.J. Howarth. June 26th, What I Wish I'd Known with Andrea von Wieckart. July 3rd, Accessibility for Arts Organizations with Janelle Shaw. And you can find more information on our website, www.creativemanitoba.ca. So before I turn things over to our panelists and to Janelle, I would like to acknowledge the land on which we stand. We are located in Treaty One territory. And at this time, it is so important to know that these are the original lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota, the Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. With the acknowledgement of this territory comes a responsibility of remembering who the caretakers of the land are. Um, to remember those who have walked before us, those who will walk behind us, and it's also our responsibility to remember those whose lives were lost and were, and were taken. So what we would like to do is to honor the 215, so I'm, I'm choked up, <laughs> to honor the 215 children uh, who were found this week. I ask for a moment of silence so that we can reflect on them and others with kindness, with love, and hope that their spirits are now free. So with that said, um, we would like to have a moment of silence now, and then Janelle will take it over. Miigwech. Thank you everyone for taking that uh, minute of silence for us. Thank you. All right, so thank you everyone. Welcome for being here. Um, as Olia said, my name is Janelle Shaw. I'm the Executive Director of Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba and I'm so happy to be partnered with Creative Manitoba to present this series of, uh, of accessibility workshops. So, to start off with, we are going to have each of the three panelists give a 15 minute presentation just about what art accessibility in the arts means to them. Uh, and then we're going to have a short 15 minute break and then we'll come back and ask some more questions for the last hour of 45 minutes. So our three presenters today are Jordan Sanglang, who is a deaf performer. Adriana Alcona, who's an artist uh, here in Winnipeg as well as a curator, and Cheryl Bronzett, who is a deaf photographer. First, we will have Jordan Sangling. So I'm going to ask uh, Andrea and Cheryl just to turn off their videos at this moment. Uh, and when it's your turn, I'll, I'll invite you to turn your videos back on. Okay. 
Great. Okay. So I'm just going to introduce Jordan very quickly, and then I'll let him uh, take it over. So Jordan Sangalang, taken under the wing of hot thespians actions, Cheryl Gill took flight with 100 decibels in the summer of 2014. Jordan made his performing, performing debut during high school in Florida, where he signed songs all around the state. He had his professional theater debut performing a play called Tribes, written by Nina Rain as Billy, a play with music called The Three Penny Opera, written by Bertolt Brecht as Mr. Peachum, and performed The Phantom of the Opera, opera as Raul, Raul. Sorry. Uh, he did ASL performances, including poetry at World Poetry Day, storytelling at the Storytelling Festival, and visual vernacular for Royal Manitoba Theatre's Tiny Plays Big Ideas Festival. Jordan aspires to show audiences the beauty of building connections through ideas and feelings in ASL. Thank you, Jordan, and uh, I look forward to hear what you're going to say. Thank you very much, Janelle. Um, so I think I might just uh, step back a little bit. I try not to uh, talk about what everybody else is talking about. So I try to focus on what I'm hearing and, or what I'm presenting on before speaking about what everybody else is saying. It looks like Jordan might be frozen. Um, so we're just going to give a minute. Oh, there we go. He's back. Never mind. <laughs> so I. Yeah, no problem. Just give me one moment. Pull up my notes. First, I just want to acknowledge, thank you very much for inviting me to be a panelist on this, to share some of my experience, my knowledge, and my background. And before I go into that, that discussion about me as a deaf performer, I just want to say appreciate being invited to this panel. Tonight, I'm going to talk about three specific um, points. Uh, first being my experience in a hearing-led theater, uh, also my experiences in deaf-led theater, and what the differences are between those two environments. My second point. And just the differences between a an interpreter versus an ASL coach and a consultant and what those those main differences are. And also my third point will be focusing around the responsibilities of the interpreter. So I'd like to do a bit of a comparison about deaf led theater and hearing led theater and what those differences are. You know, I have been involved as Janelle had mentioned at Phantom of the Opera, Three Penny Opera, um, and those were both hearing led, or sorry, the Three Penny Opera was a hearing led performance uh, to a mixed audience. When I was involved in Tribes, which was also hearing led, uh, there was much script involvement uh, as, as well as Three Penny and some translation. Uh, not only that, but thinking about the music as well and how to do the, the translation of those performances versus a deaf-led theater performance where, um, for example, when I was in involved in Phantom of the Opera, uh, that was completely deaf-led. And this is the sign that you would use for Phantom of the Opera, if you can see how I'm placing my hand over my eye like that. Um, that performance, uh, much of the rehearsal was actually done through Zoom uh, with an entirety of the cast and performers and you know assistant directors director producer stage manager everybody that was involved was was deaf and so the experiences in these two situations were very different
thinking about uh, when I was in tribes as the hearing led performance and three penny opera um, versus phantom of the opera which was very much death led that was all online even during covid we had everything as we had kind of pivoted to using digital experiences in a virtual setting but I would like to say that the main differences between those two situations, um, for example, if you're focusing on the hearing led performance, often deaf actors or performers are having to be proactive. Will there be interpreters? Um, will there be a translation um, impact on the script? Will I have to focus on educating the individuals? Will there be you know, problems within the moment, trying to not only be the performer, but also thinking about having to provide that education because you're there as the cultural, the piece and describing just the translation of the script. Because if you think about English versus ESL, the grammar, the syntax, the semantics, everything is different between those two languages. So I always have to kind of keep that in the back of my mind and be ready to provide those, those pieces while being involved. So when I accept a job like that, I always try to make sure that I have, you know, a preferred interpreter that fits the environment, fits my needs, knows the culture, knows the lingo, and is familiar with the various jargon that would come from it. It's really important to have that chemistry and to have a good connection with the interpreter that you're working with because it can really affect the creative process of the entire team. Just one moment. And so that's kind of the, the sense of what you get. Sorry, my computer was freezing, but um, of how that, that environment can present itself. Sorry, and I've lost my train of thought now because I lost my note. But to get back to it, just going to that, how that process works and what it looks like and making sure you have the right interpreter. And I'm always trying to make sure that I'm thinking about what sort of accommodations will be needed, trying to be proactive, you know, and often the energy is split. You spend half the time focusing at, on the performance, but also at the same time trying to advocate for yourself as a performer. And it can be quite taxing. Certainly, it's not always 100, where you would normally want to have the 100% focus on the creative process and the performance, it doesn't happen that way. And there was a lot of learning that I, I helped also while I was in Three Penny Opera, um, just thinking about accommodations and trying to make the whole performance very successful. Now to compare that to a deaf led, you know, production like Phantom on the Opera was, was incredible. I was able to fully focus as on my performance because the director, you know, the producer, all of the moving pieces, everybody involved was deaf. And so we had more opportunity to play with the production, play with the script, allow that those creative um, fluids to kind of gel and, and work together, thinking about the rhythm and the meter of, of the, the music and whatnot. And my energy, sorry, just one moment. Just having some technical issues, Paul, my apologies. Sorry, one second. Yeah, that's no problem, Janelle, thank you, appreciate it. I just want to make sure I can see the interpreter just for whatever reason they happen to miss something. I want to make sure I can see them as well in a, in a larger screen. So I had to make them a little bit bigger, but no problem. You know, technology is great when it works and sometimes it causes more challenges than you can expect.
But again, so to go back to the deaf led production that I was involved with, it means that we really allow our creativity to flow. The team gets a chance to really gel with each other and just focus on being the performer and everybody having their own role. And with my experience in that performance, again, remembering that this was all on Zoom, I think there was about, I wanna say there was about 30 people on the Zoom meetings that we would have our rehearsals. I wanna say, yeah, but can you imagine having 30 little screens? But the great thing about it was that as a, a deaf group, we can all communicate at the same time. Versus let's say if we have a, an entirely hearing group, there's talking over each other, which can be very difficult to understand and makes difficult to communicate with, e with each other. So that's, I guess, one of the, for sure, one of the benefits of being deaf and having everybody deaf within the group. We're able to see each other. We can talk about the process and it's just a piece of that culture and deaf hood. And as, as we, it's just a innate, um, understanding of being deaf, being able to, you know, you don't have to sit there and explain what you're doing, why you're doing it. Everybody just gets it. And every, you can just keep going and move past the basics. You can just be creative. And even just a simple thing like, you know, thinking about what we sign and then you kind of, everybody puts their attention to this the one person and then the communication kind of flows better versus you know if you were to have a, a group of hearing individuals uh, typically only one or two people can you know kind of take the floor at a time and it often has to be a little bit more controlled you can't do things as simultaneously uh, you get the information for the interpreter and the interpreter kind of delegates not delegates but more so it gets mediated through that medium versus when everybody is deaf, it's just a naturally smooth flow. Everybody gets it and you're able to kind of focus your energies on the creative process and the performance itself. I mean, there, I, I'm not, I'm not criticizing either or saying one is better than the other. It's just that it's different and there are different expectations for both of these approaches. Um, and knowing when I'm working with a deaf group, I can understand that the culture and Deaf hood is there, it's fully understood versus thinking about who that audience is. It's often the audience is typically a deaf audience and trying to kind of create that production uh, for that signing audience versus when I'm involved in a hearing led production, often the audience is also hearing. Um, so trying to work together with the group, making sure that we're able to be on the same page with the other with each other and have the same goals so that the performance fits with the audience that will be attending. So there are those are some of the, the larger differences between a deaf led or a hearing led production. So to go back to those hearing led productions, um, as a deaf performer, I often take a different approach. When I'm working with, you know, other deaf people, so I don't have to think about some of these things at the same time. We can just kind of move together, move forward at the same time. It's a different process versus if I'm working with a hearing led production, I often have to think about things in advance and having more people involved in the team. Not necessarily meaning I have to take on more responsibility, but just trying to make it as effective as possible for the performance. And as a deaf performer, I would have an ASL coach involved as well. And the ASL coach would be there as part of the team. There would be an interpreter as part of the team, uh, possibly having, let's say, an additional person as um, you know, a director or what have you, just somebody who is familiar with uh, ASL language and 
can kind of consult on that. For example, I was just involved in Tiny Plays Big Ideas, where in that setting, there was an ASL consultant involved, or also could be called an ASL coach. There was also interpreters, uh, well as uh, the director who I am familiar with, and we have worked together and they, they know, we know each other well, and we are able to kind of shoot, they work as an ally and we could connect and have a better streamlined process. And so there is a larger team to be involved. And the director, uh, the director and I had a great, have a great relationship. We have a good ability to communicate about, you know, management, tech, uh, lights, design, you know, sound design, all the different pieces. Um, we are able to kind of know that the production will affect each of those and at the same time be on the same page and therefore produces a better quality production. So in terms of the ASL consultant and an ASL coach, it gives another person there, another set of deaf eyes to kind of watch the production from that perspective, checking to make sure camera angles are accurate and clear. Or if let's say I'm signing, making sure that how I'm actually producing the sign, it is clear, should I be facing one way or another? Do I need to have my hands higher or do I need to have them lower? Are they blocking my expression? Um, just different angles that may, may or may not fit with how I'm producing the language. And often the crew itself is often hearing as well, but they don't have those deaf eyes. So having that consultant there to kind of provide that perspective. Um, just one moment. Just for the, the medium and the shot or, you know, having the them do a different pan so that the camera pans to one way or another way so that they're able to kind of spotlight the language well and a person who doesn't understand ASL would not necessarily be able to kind of pinpoint those point of views. And so that often the first step is to have that second set of eyes to make sure that the framing is right. Maybe you want to go to a more of a wide angle versus a medium shot or, you know, various other techniques or aspects to make sure that it's clear. Even just thinking about um, the camera, the filming of it, and the panning from one angle to another and just those different transitions, often it's more taken from a hearing perspective because those changes in point of view can have a different interest and a different focus versus if when somebody was deaf who was signing that in and out or zooming close-ups or to a wide angle, they're not as effective because it's visually distracting versus um, being a, a interesting. It actually causes less interest and more annoyance. And it ends up being quite choppy and it doesn't end up being successful in terms of what you're trying to get across. Uh, versus, you know, if you're hearing, it doesn't matter as much in terms of that visual aspect versus a deaf eye, uh, it actually can construe the message. So you have to think about the multiple hats that the the deaf performer or consultant is is taking on um, and to make sure that the work is as successful as it can be. And often when you're thinking about a hearing actor, uh, they they get to hear themselves. So they whatever their lines are, they can hear it sounds, they have a good understanding of how it's going to hit or, you know, impact on the audience versus uh, a deaf performer. It, it depends where that those eyes are coming from, where your audience is sitting in relation to where the performer is performing. So would I have to shift in terms of, you know, and sign with my right hand or should I be facing a different way? And in order to make that clear, you may have to shift and turn your body another way to position that posture uh, so that it is for the clarity of language. Sometimes even thinking about how big you are producing the language, because if you get too small, it's not as clear. 
another additional factor is the pace and the speed of production. Uh, you have to make sure you have those additional eyes to make sure that your hand is as clear as possible or the camera is able to catch it from an angle that makes it as clear as it could be. So there are various techniques and roles that those deaf, that the deaf consultant and the deaf coach can take on while being involved in a, a hearing led performance. As an ASL coach or consultant, one of the most imperative roles is they're really there to provide the glue between the hearing and non and deaf, making sure that the quality of the ASL is as high as it can be. So it's up to a, a high standard. And so having that ASL coach there, a consultant, kind of gives you a, a way to kind of secure that. and make sure that the experience that you're providing is authentic for the audience, not just a, a canned experience or something that you might see on social media that you know sometimes you see uh, an individual who may not be deaf, but put it, playing a deaf character. And those uh, performances are just not as authentic and they don't have a, an ag organic feel to it. So having that ASL coach there helps to bridge that gap and make sure that the performance is has a high standard of quality and is not only that but thinking about the artistic approach that you want to convey so it's very important to have that additional role in as part of the team sorry to interrupt you jordan uh you're good on time i just want to let you know that some of the deaf participants can't see you um so they can't see you signing all they see is cindy is, is it okay if we spotlight you? You might not be able to see Cindy, but then the deaf participants can see you sign so they know what's going on. Is that okay? You should be able to pin me and then, or spotlight me either way, but they should be able to, and that way I should be able to see Cindy as well. If we, if I chain, sorry. Just one moment for the interpreter. So currently I'm on gallery view, so I'm able to see it. So if you change it, will if that affect everybody or just Well, let's mine? try it and see what happens. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Let's see. Okay. Can everyone see Jordan now? If you're on an iPad, can you see Jordan? Someone type in the chat if they can see Jordan. Okay, so we're hearing that we can see Jordan. Okay. okay. So I'm gonna uh, change mine back to gallery view. Let me know if I affect anybody else's view. Okay. How was that? I think good. I, everybody can still see me. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to sign off. Jordan, you have about another five minutes. Okay. Well, I can, I can certainly wrap up in five minutes. Okay. Right. Yes. I was on to my third point. Yeah. So like I said, there is a lot of uh, responsibility for the ASL coach or consultant. Now thinking about the interpreter's role, in, in performance. Some directors uh, think that line by line translations are, are can, can happen. And often they use the interpreters to kind of provide that assistance. You know, like, how do we sign this? Or what do we do for this? When they say that, how would you sign that in ASL? And a great example I have for you is, um, Again, going back to Three Penny Opera, there were some lines in the script when we were going through, we were trying to kind of think about how that would be produced, like especially with music and thinking about the meter and the rhythm and how to kind of replicate that in ASL, but it really, Im and what that impact is to the audience. Because if you follow exactly what the script says all the time, it doesn't always meet the, 
you know, playwright's goal or what the intention was or how the impact on the audience should hit. So, or what you're trying to trigger or cause to emote in that moment and what that intention is. So you have to really think about, even though the lines are there, but what the intent and the meaning is. One example I can give you is um, the phrase, it's raining cats and dogs. If you follow that phrase in English, it's raining, like a literal translation of it, it's raining cats and dogs. It literally means like how you would sign it is that there are cats and dogs falling out of the sky, which is a completely different uh, meaning and hits a different meaning versus this, where I would sign it's literally pouring, uh, pouring water from the sky. It was a totally different um, production, but a, a direct meaning translation versus a literal translation. And as interpreters, uh, their job is to kind of facilitate between two languages, two cultures, and to kind of to make that that communication, you know, work, and not necessarily advise on the creative process of the script, and that is often the responsibility of the deaf coach or deaf consultant or the deaf performer of how that would be uh, translated often or it's common that you would see things that have to be flipped um, in uh, the translation because in the first language if however it's written in English when it's put into ASL it needs to be reversed because the ASL is has a visual language and an aspect so it changes the meaning so you really have to make sure that the goal is is met but in order to do that you have to flip the script and being as many interpreters are not deaf or not their first language um, and aren't perfect language models they're not typically you know, they haven't has as much experience and sorry, interpreter needs to back up just one moment. So often what happens is uh, the interpreter, it's just, it's not, they're not the right person for the job and they don't have a, a long history about doing that. They, they work as, you know, as the, the the mediator and and I, I can think of other examples for that. And when I'm thinking about translation, it's really important to have that ASL coach or the consultant there involved in the team. Um, to kind of be involved with the deaf performer anytime you have a deaf performer to have that second set of eyes uh, that second perspective to kind of work alongside the team along with the director so that the director and the, the consultant can work as a partnership allowing for that meaning to hit both sets of audiences equally And so to kind of sum up, I mean, I know I just talked briefly about a few different things, but I want to say that the most important part in terms of a deaf performer and uh, working between either hearing led performances or deaf led performances or productions, they have a different approach. Um, but, you know, often it's a language thing. There's there's a, a cultural piece. Um, and when I'm working with a hearing led, I have to think about access. I have to think about advocacy and education. So there's multiple roles that are impacted when it's a hearing led performance versus a deaf led production, pardon me, interpreter. I also want to just implore the, the need to have that ASL coach there, the consultant to really make sure that the intent behind the production is matched. And also that understanding the role of the interpreter it's important to really recognize um, that they have their important role and everybody has an important role versus when you're in a deaf performance versus a hearing led production. Just making sure that the communication is key and that way we can you know, have our ideas uh, or the ability to create as effectively as possible and I really do believe that we have a, 
a strong, strong belief to collaborate between deaf led performance and hearing led performance so that we can all work together. I mean, theater, theater is, you know, moving forward. There's so much that can be done. And without collaboration, that partnership is going to cause theater to be at a standstill. We don't have the opportunity to be, you know, to do things as we could without being able to collaborate with each other and having different, you know, people and everybody has a certain role. And especially it's, it's incredibly unique and in that it provides the audience with a different experience that you would neither, you would not have without that collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jordan. That was really wonderful. It's great to know uh, the benefits of getting an ASL coach. Great. Um, so now I'm going to ask Jordan to turn off his video because we're going to go on to the, uh, the next panelist. Uh, so Jordan, you can turn off your video. Andrea, uh, Adriana, I apologize. <laughs> you can turn on your video. And I'm just going to, how do I, um, so I'm just going to try to turn Jordan's spotlight off if I can figure out how to do it. Spotlight. Oh, now I'm the spotlight. Okay, so I think what I might have to do for those who are on the um, the iPad is I'll have to spotlight Cindy and I'll also try to spotlight or uh, Adriana to see. No, I can only do one. Okay, never mind. So Cindy's going to be spotlighted. So if you're on an iPad, you're only going to be able to see Cindy, but that's just so that the uh, the deaf. Um, Participants can, can see what's going on. So next up, we have Adriana, who's gonna do a quick 15 minute presentation. Adriana Alcon is an artist living on Treaty One territory, a first generation immigrant from Guatemala of complex identities. Alcon is Latin, cisgender, queer, and living with disability. As a mestiza woman, she recognizes Maya Kekchi, her Spanish ancestry, though no direct claim to indigenous community, these identities guide her work to explore coexisting contradictions in everyday life. Alarcon incorporates cultural craft traditions and ancestral knowledge with contemporary narratives using fiber-based fiber crafts, such as knitting, crochet, embroidery, beading, and weaving. She has a bachelor's degree from York University in Cultural Studies. Alarcon combined her art practice with arts administration in Toronto and Winnipeg, working at artist run centers such as A Space, Carfact Ontario, Craft Action Toronto, and Mentoring Artists and Women's Art. Adriana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle. And thank you, Jordan, for your, um, your contribution today. Um, Really, I wanted to, to begin with acknowledging um, uh, as an immigrant to Treaty One territory, I, I do understand and respect the sacrifices and the terrible losses that were suffered um, by indigenous communities prior to our, our arrival and our wel welcoming here. And um, once again, to, to observe a moment um, in solidarity with indigenous communities uh, after the, the, the news uh, of this week at the finding of the 215 children. And just to mention that um, I really appreciate being asked um, to contribute on this on these topics. Today, I will be speaking mostly from my personal experience, my, uh, my personal um, identities, as, as Janelle mentioned, are somewhat complex and somewhat mixed. And my identity as an artist, as a disabled artist, and as an arts administrator um, come together in, in my role um, that I currently, where I currently work at mentoring artists for women's art. And I guess with regards to the work at MAWA, we work in collaboration with Creative Manitoba a lot. We work in collaboration with a and and we 
um, we constantly work to create safer spaces. And I will talk a little bit more about what creating safer spaces means to me. But first I wanted to acknowledge the role that I have at MAWA, um, whereas I do a lot of work to create to create safer spaces, this, the space was created for me. This, the role was created with, um, with an eye to accessibility um, to adapt to my needs. And so I wanted to talk about from the perspective of being an artist with disabilities, working in this environment and what that has meant. And I, I wanna say that it took a long time to, for me to unengrain or to, to dis, dis learn to, to take away the learnings from previous employment where my, my accessibility needs were not met or were not taken care of. And when I began working at, in Winnipeg, I created a new environment for myself, both as an artist and in my arts administrator job, where, for example, I had a back injury and we um, got a sit-stand desk with hydraulics so that I could stand rather than sit for long periods of time, but also I could sit down after standing for long periods of time. And I use that type of desk um, at work at MAWA and also at home. So at home, I'm fully equipped to work remotely long before the pandemic. I was fully equipped because there would be needs for me to work from home um, depending on my ability. Because I'm a person with an invisible disability and more or less some days I appear to be fully fun functioning, um, then I, I need to take care of myself both at home and at work. So I prepared a little presentation that does it mess things up if I share my screen in terms of uh, viewing the, the ASL interpreter. Okay, I'm gonna keep going and hope that everything is okay. And if it's not okay, somebody will tell me. So in my role at MAWA as a, as a program, program coordinator, Often I am making the arrangements for participants or presenters to be incorporated. And I'm often adding or subtracting certain layers of the planning. And this was a practice that was already in place at MAWA. Hi. Hi, sorry, Adriana, the, the, they can't see the interpreter now. So we might have to okay, not speak to you. Sorry that. about that. I'll do without it. I'll just use it to um, to inform me of what I need to speak about. Um, sorry, where was I? So, in terms of working at MAWA, I the role was already there, but we made some changes. As I as I was saying before, we made changes in terms of making my schedule work. Um, adding breaks and rests after big events, um, changing the sort of expectations um, around my ability to be on for extended periods of time. I'm a person that, that needs a lot of breaks because of my, my disability. So you know, certain things had to change. Certain things were already there, but certain things had to change. So, and then in terms of creating the space for others, um, we have continually been adding layers to, to what we do in terms of creating a safer space. And what creating safer spaces means to me is that it is a practice. You're always being proactive and you're always learning from mistakes or learning from different adaptations that may or may not work. So 
it's a continuous cycle of how are we going to do this event? What do we need to take it consider? What do we need to add? And what I might do is I'll I'll send uh, the presentation to Janelle and so that people can have this content. But I was thinking about um, how people might expect to engage with other art, arts organizations and with other artists with disabilities. And the phrase that really just came to my mind today was just ask. Simply by asking, we can clarify a lot of misunderstandings or misgivings of what is necessary. And as much as there are things that we already have in practice and in policy, there's always something new that might come up. So for example, when you're describing events or when you're, um, when you're sending out announcements for events, we could say something like, we strive to host inclusive accessible events that where all individuals, including individuals with disabilities can engage fully. We respect those people with allergies and environmental sensitivities. So we ask you to refrain from wearing strong fragrances. We request, um, you know, participants to let us know what they might need. And you could say, you could be very clear and say to request an accommodation or for inquiries about accessibility, please contact and then include your name, my name, Adriana, my email, my phone number. And by asking, you're entering into a dialogue. So the kind of things that might come back would be um, if the answers from participants or the answers from other, um, from, from other panelists might be people need an assistive listening device people might need captioning, they might need a reserved front seat in the times when we could have events with seats. Um, large print, I really recommend large print for everything that you do and you put out into the world, um, especially your PowerPoint slides. Um, as things get shared, everything becomes smaller and smaller and less and less legible. So always start with large print. Um, advanced copies of slides to be projected, wheelchair access, wheelchair access to working tables, wheelchair, wheelchair access to bathrooms. You don't know how many times you have to be very specific about wheelchair access to everything. Um, things like a, being a scent free environment are things that can be easily um, signed, like as in with signage. Um, you can be very clear that this is a scent free environment. And then some people might ask for a lactation room or for general, we could, you could state in your policies that you have gender neutral bathrooms. When it comes to meals and foods, uh, if, if you ask for diet restrictions, I would just simply provide blank spaces and allow people to tell you what their diet restrictions are. Um, because a lot of times the check marks under diet restrictions don't go well together for people. Like some people might have dairy restrictions, but not um, to all, you know, not want to simply be defined as vegan. So really just allow people to tell you what they need. And then in this kind of checklist, sometimes it says other. And then in my experience, it's always been the, the space for other where I have to fill in the things that might affect me as, a, as an artist or as, a, as an individual. So for example, the kind of things that, that I've seen and some of these things might be things that are personal to me and some things that, that I've seen in, in different environments. One thing to consider um, in, in, virtual, in physical spaces is Strobing, strobe lights. It, strobing lights can cause migraines or they can cause seizures. So um, being mindful of notifying people when, uh, when there might be strobing lights in the environment that you're asking them to, 
to come into. Um, I've asked for aisle seats or seats that are that are easy to act to exit because like I mentioned earlier, I can't sit for a prolonged period of time. So being able to leave rather than like, you know, you don't want to be in a in a movie theater and be in the middle middle of the spaces and have to interrupt everybody just so that you can leave and relieve your back. Um, easy access to washrooms, easy access to the exits, trigger warnings. Um, some people have expressed that including trigger warnings kind of makes them feel like they're censoring their work. But in terms of accessibility, I'd rather allow people to choose and have agency as to whether or not they will stay for certain content. So I'm, I'm a fan of trigger warnings. Um, private spaces might be required. I mentioned earlier for lactating, but also they might be required for prayer. If your event is going over several hours, people might need to step away and you wanna tell them this is a, this is a safe place for you to go. Um, other things to consider is, remember when we used to have openings at galleries and um, there was always wine, but how about having non-alcoholic beverages? Sometimes that can be uh, overlooked and that is something that um, I advocate for is always having different options for people. In terms of um, private spaces, um, you know, sometimes sometimes people need a, a place to rest, not necessarily, um, not necessarily to go and and leave the space altogether, but just a quieter environment um, and transportation options. So, sorry, I'm a little bit all over the place with these with this list. Um, Transportation options, um, we for events such as crafternoons or um, events where everyone is welcome, sometimes we, we give bus tickets, um, but you know the kindest thing and the, the, the collaborative thing to do sometimes at the end of the, an event is, is to organize ride shares or to to ask someone if they need, or if somebody does need something, they can just offer, um, they can ask. And, and in Winnipeg, I see a really lovely tradition of, of everyone taking care of each other in that regard with respect to, to transportation. In terms of the content that you share, whether it's on Zoom or, at events and workshops, making a content available um, in various formats. So some people are more of a visual learner. Some people need the step-by-step -step instructions written down and they can follow at their own pace. So having things like video, audio, text, graphics, having things available in, in all the different formats or as many as you can. Um, that makes an environment uh, an environment more more accessible means more welcoming and more and more successful event. And for me, one of the things that we we did in at Mawa is we created a backup plan um, strategy where if I am suddenly unavailable on the day of an event, somebody is scheduled to work as my backup. And this is the thing that we learned as we went. Um, at the beginning of my, of my tenure at MAWA, I was expected to be at many, many events and I became, I, I became sick with a flare up. And we developed a thing where, okay, Adriana works today. If Adriana can't make it, Shauna will be there. And every day we, you know, we check in with each other. Most of the time I can, I can make it, but if I can't make it, Shauna knows that she is on deck. And the last thing, how am I doing for time? Um, you're just about there. So if you could wrap okay. up in a minute, that would be wonderful. Uh, 
Okay, so I'll wrap up. I wanted to talk about accessible means of contact. And one of the things that I learned on my job is people have different ability to, to, be, um, to be available to you by the different means of contact available. So some people don't like phone calls. Some people um, are very direct with their text, with their emails or texts. And sometimes uh, people might need leeway in terms of the expected time, amount of time that it takes for them to respond. So whereas you might have an expectation that I send you an email and you respond right away and we, we communicate really easily with each other, that might not always be the case with all of your participants. So communication um, shouldn't be expected to be as quick as the technology allows. So give people an, uh, an extra couple of days to respond. And I included that today because we're living in a pandemic. We're living in a world that is really, everything is online at all times. And we need, it to, we need to allow ourselves some rest and some time to be able to respond to things and not have that weight, weight of expectation. Um, okay, she said I was almost out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you, Adriana. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, so it's great to learn about safer spaces and all of that. Uh, so now I'm going to invite you to turn off your video again. As we move on to Cheryl, I'm just going to take the spotlight now off of Cindy and put it on to the next interpreter, Tessa. So I just one more minute till I figure it out. Um, okay. So I now have Cheryl spotlighted so that we can see Cheryl. So I'm going to, um, so I actually, I'm gonna spotlight Tessa just for one minute while I give my introduction of Cheryl. Uh, so that the deaf participants can see see the interpreter, and then I will switch it over to Spotlight Cheryl. Um, just one second, I seem to have closed my document. There we go. Okay, so Cheryl Bronzett is a deaf, self-taught photographer, born and raised, raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba. She briefly explored photography in her early 20s, but didn't pick up the camera again until 2013, when she took some photography courses, continuing her studies to this day. Her new passion centers on photography as an art form, which captures the deaf community's way of life. Through her art, she reflects her experiences and expresses her true value in life. When reflecting on her photos and the subjects captured in them, a sense of absolute connection comes over Cheryl, knowing that they share a language, culture, and experiences both positive and negative. She wants others to see her work and to see what deaf people's daily experience look like in their community and outside in the non-deaf world. I make art because I am part of that picture. Uh, I will now pass it over to Cheryl and I'm gonna spotlight Cheryl so that uh, everyone can see her. Cindy, can you hear me? Can you say something? I can't hear you. Okay. Get good. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody can see me. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, I want to say thank you for allowing me to be involved in tonight's panel discussion and you know, talking about my experience on accessibility with art. So for the past little while, yeah, I've eight years have been involved in photography and really, really involved, really trying to immerse myself in that art form. The Manitoba Cultural Society of the Deaf got a grant uh, funds to 
uh, through see seeing the voices, and which included uh, funds for interpreting. So we hired an interpreter and a photographer, Sheila Spence, and there was a group of deaf of, uh, people, I think about eight of us all together. And she taught us how, um, right from beginning to the very end on how to set up an art show. And so we took the course, we learned so much from her. I can't even like, we had the interpreters there. It was just a wonderful experience, great communication, great learning opportunity. And then in the fall, we had an actual exhibition. And it was just amazing the people that came to see the exhibition. I think there's like 200, 300 people that came to see art, uh, deaf artists, deaf photographers. And it was uh, the first time I'd experienced anything like that. <clears throat> what an art show, what an exhibition, like from beginning to end, everything, all the details that went into planning it. And I think I had four art shows up to date, but very grateful for that initial experience and very grateful for MCSD to have the funds that provided us that opportunity. One thing that really impacted me was the Canadian Human Rights Museum. They had announced that they were going to be uh, a show and it was for Canada 150 and they were inviting a photographer artist to send in their photographs. So there was about 1000 photographs people that sent in their work, but only 70 got chosen. I said, oh, I'm not going to do it, you know, cause not gonna be worth it. And people were saying, no, please submit, submit your work. So I sent in a photo and I got chosen. I got chosen to show uh, one of my uh, photographer, one of my pictures. And I was just shocked, I was flabbergasted. Uh, there was four different categories, um, and I think I was chosen for freedom of expression. And so the picture, uh, the uh, photo that I showed was myself and my family, um, deaf parents and a deaf child using American Sign Language at the kitchen table. So we were just having a conversation, which happens very rarely. It's like only 10% of deaf children have that access to ASL language from their parents. <clears throat> Some, you know, deaf children have access through their parents learning sign language, but the majority of them don't. They don't have that experience of being able to talk at the kitchen table. So I had chosen one of my photos and had submitted that. And so that's how I got my artwork out there because it showed the language, it showed the culture that I'm a part of. And personally, and the photographs that I like to take are of, you know, people signing who are deaf, uh, capturing cultural moments because, and their expression, because I'm a part of that. That is me. It's a reflection of me. Um, I feel like very connected to that. And then I want people to see the pictures to also feel that too. I know exactly what they're talking about, especially other deaf people when they see the photographs. <clears throat> I feel that I'm very connected and very um, drawn and in, in the actual art. I am the art. And I want to show the non-deaf community um, how, we, how we express, how we live. And I want them to see that aspect of it, that it's a cultural minority group. So that's my goal is to have more of those types of photographs out there and hopefully, you know, someday actually do an exhibition and to show that type of artwork. Originally, there was two deaf photographers and they wanted to take up a photography course. That's kind of what started it all 20 years ago. And like, like I said, I did it in my twenties, but then really didn't pick it up till recent years. <clears throat> and it was because of a uh, course that I wanted to take, but there was no interpreters. It was from Prairie View Photography School. And um, they said, sorry, we can't provide you with the course because we don't have my funds for the interpreter. And I'm like, oh, what am I gonna do? I wanna take this course. So I said, okay, well, let's see who else might be interested within the deaf community. And I joined, I think there was about 10 of us and then it dwindled down to about seven or six of us who continued on. 
But again, always having the interpreters be an issue. So we convinced employment uh, income to fund the initial interpreters for the first course. But it was just for one course and that's it. Meanwhile, they had so many courses to offer and but they only said that they would fund for one course. So we took the course and and that was very limiting, but I took the course and everybody loved it, but we figured, okay, well, that's only one course. There, there's more out there to learn. Like we just learned the very, very basics. I, I, I wanna take this further and I wanna learn more about it. So the group of us, we wanted to really continue and we didn't want anybody to say, no, you can't. So we decided to fundraise. We did our own fundraising for funds. We did a lot of work. And I just, you know, I can't thank the deaf community enough for supporting us in our endeavors. Like I can't, without them, it would never, we would never be able to take future courses ever. We would never been able to be involved in that. So I can't thank the deaf community enough for their support. So we fundraised funds to support uh, taking the courses and we got paid for having interpreters, you know, and, and I thought, okay, to go to eight courses, but I still feel not 100% satisfied with the, the amount that I've learned. I feel like there's more out there that I can learn more in-depth meaning behind photography. I, I'm involved in a sense of, um, just hold a sense of vision loop. Yes, a sense of vision loop. And it's on Instagram. And it's a group of us that I'm involved in. It's deaf photographies, photographers, and they're deaf photographers. So I thought I joined this group and it's just expanded and it's all across North America. There's probably about 30 deaf photographers. And we support each other, we mentor each other, we encourage each other. And so one of the group uh, decided to set up a business. And it's called Fanning Marquia and Marquee, Finding Maraki. And so they hired deaf photographers and they actually developed an online course. So made the, everything into a video and then had it uh, programmed to be an online course, but it was all done in ASL. Everything was done in ASL. So we didn't need to have an interpreter. My access to this online course was all through ASL. So, I mean, I was able to fully learn, fully immerse myself in that course. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, the course, they had many different types of courses. You know, you can do fam beach, family, portraits, um, you know, aerials, drones. So there's 16 different courses all with under this one company, but again, they're all deaf teachers and all done in ASL. And that was, I thought, just amazing. It means I can take up any course at any time. So I'm gonna hopefully do uh, a second course soon. Not now, but a little bit later, but I'm definitely going to be taking a course because I can just sit there and just take in the information in ASL. I don't have to worry about the planning, the, you know, the preparing or anything like that, preparing the interpreters. I can just take the course. And my goal is, you know, for the next little while is to find myself a mentor that can teach me, you know, doing scenes family sessions, portraits, and, you know, know how to do everything from beginning to end, you know, in Winnipeg, in Canada, like, I have to find, again, a hearing mentor, and again, who's going to pay for the interpreter, who's going to have the time and the money, so again, I don't want to pay out of pocket to have the access through an interpreter for courses. I don't feel that that is correct. I just feel, you know, I just, just pay for the course and not pay for the accessibility part. <clears throat> you know, sometimes it's like double the cost for us. We have to, you know, pay for the course and then pay for the interpreter. And that's one thing I'm struggling right now is finding a mentor 
who is local that I can, you know, not have to go outside of Canada? You know, do I have to do it through Zoom or through, um, you know, other online platforms, but to actually have a physical person there, you know, maybe I can fly for a week and we can have that mentoring and then I can fly back home. Again, there's more cost in term for that type of accessibility and mentorship. So there's always, you know, thinking about the cost, you know, again, if I'm going to fly to meet somebody, I have to think about hotel and food, et cetera, et cetera. So I always feel that that's also a huge barrier. You know, so I have to apply for grant funds to see if I can get money to pay for the interpreter. But again, that is a lot of work. So that is one, uh, you know, a barrier out there that prevents me from taking my craft further. I'm not finished, of course. I will somehow work through that barrier. I'll figure it out. I'm not going to give up. And again, setting up a business for art, having your art as your business is art management, your career. So I had taken up that course before, but I wasn't completely satisfied with what I'd learned. I'd got a basics, but uh, you know, in terms of running a business, you know, what do I do for my income tax? What do I need to do? What types of receipts do I need to keep? Uh, how do I keep my mileage? Uh, do I need a business license? Where do I get that? Where do I go? Those are the types of details that I don't feel comfortable um, knowing. I just don't feel like I know enough. So I plan to ask MCSD, maybe, if they could provide that course again uh, or to apply for another grant so we can take that type of course again, whether it be photography, painting, but just have it uh, accessible through an interpreter to all, to all deaf professionals you know, just to make sure that we have an equal skin in the game. I'm just giving you a one minute wrap up. Oh, okay, really? Um, 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 okay, let me see what I wanna say then. Okay. So a sense of vision loop Again, having the photographers all across North America every Wednesday at 8.15 Manitoba time, central time. So East Coast, West Coast, but all at the same time, we post on Instagram all at the same time. So we post what we've done that week. And again, like I said, it is the really supportive group and it's an amazing feeling to be part of it. I feel like I, I'm part of a collective. It's just amazing that, that Instagram group that I have. And the Art of Managing Your Career course. My name, my sign name is Cheryl Brozite. It's CZ because it's, uh, it's my maiden name, Zimmer. So when I was thinking within the group, um, you know, at that time, People were saying, you know, my first name starts with a C. So it's capture unique moments, which would normally be with an S, but I put a Z to represent my maiden name Zimmer. And I was like, that is a perfect name for my business. It is perfect. So thanks for that group for helping me come up with my name for my, my, my photography. So yeah, I guess that's about it really. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was really great. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick 10-minute um, break uh, just for accessibility-wise. And when we come back, we're going to ask some questions. So if anybody has any questions they would like to ask the panelists, put some in the chat. Uh, I also have the list of questions people ask ahead of time. So we'll start with those when we return in 10 minutes. So go grab a coffee, everyone. Bye. See you in 10.
right, so that's our 10 minute break. I'm just gonna wait for the interpreter to turn on the video. Just wanted to say that was all really wonderful. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right, so we got Tessa back. So for those who didn't hear, Rachel said thank you to all of the panelists for the presentation they had done. Uh, I would like to invite the panelists to turn on their videos and unmute um, at this time if they would like, and we will start the Q&A period. All right, just waiting for Jordan. Jordan. So the way that we're going to do this, um, it might be a little bit confusing, but we want to make sure that all of the deaf participants are able to either see the interpreter or the deaf panelists as they sign. Um, so if Jordan or Cheryl are answering a question, I'm going to spotlight them so that everyone can see them sign. And if it's Adriana or myself answering a question, I will put the spotlight back onto the interpreter. Um, so if anyone has any questions for the panel, please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, but for now, we're going to go with some of the questions that were asked ahead of time. So this first question is probably for Jordan or Cheryl. How can I best communicate with artists who are deaf when I'm presenting them in my festival? What are some of their needs and how can they best be met? Um, if anybody wants to answer the question, just put up your hand and I'll spotlight you. Oh, Cheryl's got a hand up. Here we go. Yep, Cheryl says I can answer. I guess, you know, for me is to hire the interpreters. Yeah, so I have that access. You know, for an example, um, who needs the interpreter often is the question, really? Is it me as a deaf person? No, it's not only me, it's you as the non-deaf person too who needs the interpreter. You know, for an example, I was able to communicate, but it was you who needed the interpreter at that moment. It wasn't me. So we both need the interpreter. So people think, oh, we need to hire the interpreter for the deaf person. And that's not true. It's, it's a two-way conversation. It's a two-way street. So the interpreter is for both of us. So hire an interpreter. Oh, okay. Now we're going to switch to Jordan. Am I doing it or you? I am. And so I just wanted to echo what uh, Cheryl's comments were. You know, as she had said, mentioned before about the 10%, I 100%, I 110%, I totally agree. You know, it's not only the deaf person, like deaf performers, photographers, artists. You want to be able to give um, whatever that art is, give the access to everyone. So having that interpreter there and it provides the opportunity for deaf people to show what their talents are, give them the opportunity to show their skills. And that way you can see it's a two way street. So that way everybody can understand each other and it provides that bridge between the two cultures and languages. Great, thank you, Jordan. 
and chill. Okay, so the next question, number two is, where can I have private sessions asking about some disability matters and art and its conditions? Uh, I'm just gonna briefly say that at Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba, that's one of our jobs and something that we are happy to do. So you can always email me at info at aanm.ca to ask any questions. Um, but Shara, Adriana, Jordan, do you guys have a response? Just put up your hand if you do. Nope. Okay, and again, Cheryl here. Show. For me, I guess a solution could be, you know, for example, with, you know, Manitoba has many different art organizations uh, within Manitoba. And I'm always wondering, I mean, I wonder if we can somehow pool together some money and then actually hire a deaf person that could liaison between all the other organizations, provide that information, provide an explanation, education to either deaf, hearing, latent deaf. Um, yeah, I think, you know, like one stop shop would be okay. Like I know there's so many organizations, so it'd be nice to have a deaf person within that role that could do all that education. Um, you know, so if someone, an organization, you know, they're needing someone because there was an announcement being made, they can ask that deaf person to videotape themselves in ASL doing that announcement. So that could be part of the role. And then the deaf community can access it that way. And then they might be interested in whatever event is being happening, you know, whether it be through this organization or that organization. So <clears throat> I think, you know, it would be interesting to have that, to plant the seed so other organizations could maybe, you know, find funding, you know, have like, my dream is to have the Manitoba Deaf Art Center. But I, you know, want to plant that seed because it is a dream of mine to have that one person um, you know, organize all of that and be the liaison to all the other organizations and to have the art center, you know, for Manitobans, you know, show pay artists that paint, show artists that take for pictures, you know, again, have that here at home, within our home. We don't have anything like that. So it'd be nice to have that. You're muted, Janelle. Yeah, we can't hear you, Janelle. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't see Adriana's or Jordan's hands up, so we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, so this is another question that was asked ahead of time. Actually, Jordan, Although, actually, oh, if oh. I wouldn't, if you don't mind, I let me ask. just spotlight Jordan. One minute. Okay. And make sure I want to understand that, that question correctly. So if um, somebody is directly asking about uh, a disability, was that kind of the, the meaning behind the question? And Cheryl saying, yes, like who, like how do you ask a question about disability? How do you have that conversation? That's primarily what the question was. Great, thank you, Cheryl. And my comments are are similar to Cheryl's as well. Um, you know, if you end up meeting someone in person and try not to expect that one person doesn't represent all deaf people, right? And it is important to really ask what their their needs are, what those what those requests might be of that particular person. Maybe they maybe they prefer captioning. Maybe they want uh, American Sign Language. What are those those needs? Because we are a diverse group, and answering one person's needs doesn't fit for everybody. So just trying to think about, you know, it's going to depend on what your relationship with this person, how you ask that question, whether they're willing to express it, whether they open, they're they're willing to kind of share that with you. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm 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 deaf, or and maybe they're not so open book about it they want to it really is going to depend on the relationship between those two parties as well it's important to think about 
Great. Uh, Adriana, did you have a response or should we go on to the next question? No, okay. So the next question is, for those with less visible or less recognizable disabilities, how do you manage and would you suggest managing disclosure or should you always disclose? Um, oh, Adriana has an answer, so we're going to keep the spotlight on Tessa, but uh, Adriana, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, so with regards to people with, um, with invisible disabilities, one of the things that we try to do um, is um, lead by example. So for example, I would often begin a, begin a workshop and just state that this is what I need this in order to be functional here in the space, or this is what I might do. An example for, for me is like, if we're having a circle, discussion I and, and it, everyone's seated in chairs in a circle, I will usually stand sort of outside of the circle. And I'll, I'll explain that I'm doing that because I can't sit for very long and I can't sit in those chairs. So I'll, I'll say I'm, I'm, I'm here and participating, but I'm, I'm in the back. Um, and if anybody has any other needs that I need to accommodate, please let me know. So I, that's what I do is I, I bring it, bring it up myself and I open it up for people to, to let me know what they might need. That's a really great idea. I love that idea of, of leading by example. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, Jordan, Shale, did you guys have uh, a response to this? Or? Oh, Shale does. Okay, let me just spotlight her. And again, if you go to an art event of any kind, I always let them know that I would need an interpreter and to make sure that they're prepared to have an interpreter ready and have that coordinated. Sometimes what happens though, is that I know I need to let them know, you know, a week ahead of a time, I can't do something last minute just because they might not have an interpreter available. So I have to let them know one week in advance. And again, like one week later, maybe I don't feel well on that exact day that I you know, booked the interpreter. So sometimes I feel obligated to go and to the event because I know they've gone through the process of booking an interpreter. And then, you know, if I don't show up, then they're like, well, why did I book an interpreter? Because they assumed that I just didn't want to go, but me, me, I'm not feeling well. So there's a lot of sometimes guilt associated to booking an interpreter and then having to go. There's that sense of obligation because I know if, you know, a deaf person doesn't show up, they still have to pay for the interpreter. So sometimes I feel a little bit trapped and obligated to go. And so I understand that, you know, they need the notice to book the interpreter. Absolutely. I'm just hoping, you know, in the near future that you can just have an interpreter there just in case as a standby, just in case someone shows up. You know, I know, I think it was like, there's um, the first Fridays of the month, like, yeah, where you artists can go from different, they have that event, but I sometimes can't go because it might not, you know, suit my need at that particular day, or I might want to go, but I can't because they haven't booked the interpreter. And so I tend to, you know, having an interpreter booked just in case someone shows up and having that accessibility, I think is, a, is the way to go. But again, I know it's a hard situation. Um, but again, if we're talking about making things more accessible, this is one option. Okay, we're going to go back to Adriana. She has her hand up. Go ahead, Adriana. Yes, um, Cheryl, thank you for bringing that up. I um, wanted to mention that before during my talk is one of the things that we've moved um, right now that we're doing is having uh, ASL interpretation at our first Friday lectures as a matter of a standing every month. We, we allow that. And that means that hopefully more people will find their way to our lectures. And as much as possible in, in planning uh, events going forward, it's, it's a matter of budgeting and, and policy and, and negotiations, but 
the the spirit right now is towards having more and more events um, with ASL interpretation available um, at the ready. And the other things that we're doing is providing the videos uh, with captioning at a, at a later date. So if you missed an event, it can be, uh, it's accessible in our website and you can um, watch the videos on our website with captioning. Great, thanks Adriana. And I see Shell has her hand up, so I'm gonna go back to Shell. Um, what was it? I think it was AANM. Uh, I was watching a video actually. It was uh, La Maria LeBlanc, yeah. The art of dress or the overdress. It wasn't live, um, but it was uh, recorded. And I had access to it because there was an interpreter ready and closed captions were there. And I enjoyed watching the video so much. I watched it from beginning to end and what a fascinating story. So for me, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I want more of that. I can just go into and watch a video and know that I'll be able to watch it and enjoy it. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for bringing, bringing that up, Cheryl. That's something that at AANM we've tried to do from now on. Anytime we do any interviews, uh, we always have an ASL interpreter and then try to add the closed captioning after. Um, so Jordan, did you have anything else to add to this about, um, how I guess, managing disclosure or anything? Nope, I think no. we're good. I think Cheryl said everything. Yep, everything that Cheryl said was perfect. Okay, great. Uh, then let's go on to the next question. Now, this is a very important question for these times. How do you reach out to youth, uh, to indigenous artists, artists in the black community? Uh, do you work with nonprofits for this? Um, just to say in terms of AANM, we try to share all of our calls, uh, any information with as many different art organizations as possible to try to, to reach as many communities as possible. Um, but do, do any of you three have any advice for reaching those kind of um, out, those communities that are kind of hard to get in touch with? Okay, Jordan, I'm gonna put a spotlight on you. I think actually you could start using TikTok. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, that's, you know, there's a lot of young people. There's a lot of things happening on TikTok. It's certainly more popular and it might get the word out further. Um, but just that idea of social media, right? That's one piece of the puzzle and certainly a tool to kind of reach those audiences and to generate some, some engagement. And also just the idea of creating safe, safe spaces so that people are feeling like they, they are, you know, safe to come. Um, even, for example, if you see the way I've had my name here, you've, I've got Jordan Sanglang and then brackets, I have he, him in brackets. Just thinking about this is a safe space for, you know, the LGBTQ community, showing that I'm an ally, somebody that they could, you know, trust or feel like they could trust. So trying to engage that community, you know, and if there's some resistance to it, trying to create that space in advance for, for individuals you know, just try to kind of get them involved and just show them that the space is already, we've thought of them and trying to get them involved. Uh, you know, and for example, if there are no interpreters as a deaf person, that that's a barrier. So not necessarily an unsafe space, but just a barrier then, which is kind of, you know, marginalizing a community and not allowing them to go. So having representative different organizations, within the community, um, often people will say, well, because there's no representation, then I won't end up going to those, those places because the relationship isn't there yet. So trying to acknowledge the culture, uh, I don't know, and, and maybe provide their food, I don't know, it's just an idea, but uh, just build that bridge and to really connect with groups, various groups and trying to get them engaged in, in what you're offering. And in terms of, 
you know, thinking about cultural values and the times, you know, like, let's say, you know, it's at seven o'clock, you have to also think about maybe extending those times, you know, if, if someone joins late or something like that, uh, not to be worried about it, that, that may just be that they're in their culture, that's something that happens, to try to create this space and have it be welcoming, so that you can get people to continue to want to be involved, as opposed to feel judged or, or something to that effect. Great, great idea, creating safe spaces, welcoming spaces, wonderful ideas. Okay. Oh, you know what? There's a question from Alex in the chat. So we'll just go ahead and ask it. Alex Elliott asks, I'm curious about how accessible Cheryl and Jordan have found the process of applying for grant applications, specifically Canada Council for the Arts. Has your experience been as accessible as they promote? Have either of you applied to Canada Council for the Arts? I've done a few applications with deaf. Uh, oh, we got some hands up. So well, Cheryl was first, so I'm going to spotlight Cheryl, and then Jordan will be next. Yes, um, my, experience, my first experience applying for a grant um, for the Canadian, was it, uh, was it the, yeah, the Canadian grant, yeah, from the Arts Council. I can't remember if it was Manitoba or Canadian. I can't remember. I think it was the Canadian Arts Council. I applied for a grant there. And I took it uh, for, again, for that managing my career, the art of managing my career. And there was a deaf group that was taking this. So we applied as a group and we sent off the application, but they only approved it for one person. They didn't approve it for the group. So they, I guess, you know, took advantage of the fact that I got the grant and used the interpreters, even though the interpreter was specifically just for me, but that's fine. I said, you know, come on in, like, we're all going to be seeing the same person. So we all took it. And then um, I guess I got their, uh, their check for income tax. And I'm like, what is this about? Why are they sending me an income? Do I have to pay tax on a grant fund because of the interpreters? And I'm like, what is going on here? I wasn't too sure. So I gave it and then I paid the money for, so I got taxed on the money that I received, but I wasn't really too sure. I mean, because why would I pay taxes on funds that I got paid to pay for another interpreter? So I was a bit confused about that whole process. So then I didn't apply for any more grants because I don't want to be taxed on funds that I was given to be used for interpreters because I didn't feel that was right. You know, if I'm applying for grants, um, you know, for my actual artwork, then I expect to pay taxes, but not on the fact that I got money to pay for interpreters so I could have access. I don't really feel that that was not um, appropriate. I felt I should be exempt from that. But again, the information on filling out the grant can be difficult too. I think this was like five years ago I started and they just started really trying to be really accessible and there was no access to information in ASL. So I had to help lots of people fill out the form and make sure I had the English and the grant had to be done in English. But I think it's you know definitely changing and becoming a little bit more accessible. But I think I can actually submit a video of myself and uh, supplying the answers. I'm not sure, 100% sure of this, but I'm not sure, I know they were working towards it, but I'm not sure if that's the case now. It still might have to be provided in English. My first language is American Sign Language, not English. Again, so having it to be presented in English sometimes can be um, a challenge. And then also receiving money that is to go towards accessibility services, but then being charged tax on it as well. And uh, hey, Alex, thanks for the question. Um, I wanted to just add a little bit as well. Like Canada Council of the Arts is very accommodating. I've, uh, they do have a deaf staff person who's involved in their, their grant process. And they, they do provide the option if you want to submit the grant in English or in American Sign Language. So prior to submission, you just have to reach out to them first. And then they basically take the lead from there. So they, they are recognizing that fact that if you want to provide that in your first language of ASL. 
and their and big after bill the bill was passed recognizing ASL as an official language of deaf individuals ASL LSQ um, it, they are now allowing for grants to be to be submitted in their first languages and the not only that but the panel the grant panel who assesses the the applications also have a deaf person involved often so I found that they've been very accommodating um and maybe when you look at the website you might not be able to see it but if you reach out I can't remember who who does it I think it's Elizabeth Sweeney I believe is the individual who does that let me add it into the chat as well just in case you know you miss it and you, you can look back to the chat but I believe they're part of the grant process for grant submissions so if you reach out they're they're fairly accessible and responsive so they've been they've been pretty great You're, you're muted, Janelle. We can't hear you, Janelle. <laughs> oh, and I was saying something so good. Okay, so um, that was really great. Thank you, Cheryl and Jordan. Uh, we have a response from one of our uh, attendees, Alice Crawford, who is the liaison, uh, sorry, the project director for the Manitoba Cultural Society of the Deaf. So I'm just going to allow her to talk. Uh, so Alice, you should be able to speak now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Jordan is right, there is more accessibility with Canada Council for the Arts. We just recently had a meeting with Elizabeth Sweetney uh, to ask about uh, a project we were thinking of applying to get a grant and they supplied us with an interpreter and it was super easy. Um, it was amazing, really. The amount of accessibility there is now compared to when I first started with um, uh, Deaf Arts Manitoba, it, it's a huge jump. And uh, I'm really happy to see that. And you can submit your grant application as an ASL video, you just need to check with Elizabeth or whoever the contact is to make sure your grant is um, suitable for what you're applying for it. And then you can take it from there. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alice. Well, we only, oh, Jordan, we'll move it back to Jordan and then we're going to wrap up with one last question. Sounds good. Yeah, just one comment that I wanted to put out there uh, in terms of Canada Council for the Arts. They are recognizing that there is a lot of barriers to deaf artists and performers and whatnot. So they're trying to really make it an even playing field so that if, you know, in terms of you know people that have disabilities or or what have you they're trying to really engage those groups and and so far as it seems it's been very successful great okay so um there is one more question in the chat but we i'm just gonna uh, address one more question that uh, one of the uh, attendees had sent in at a, ahead of time uh because we're short on time i'm gonna direct it right to adriana since Cheryl and jordan had the last uh, couple questions there so Adriana, um, what kind of access accessibility issue have you personally been impacted by and, and how did you solve this? Yes, um, let's see, I, I can think of different things. Um, I mentioned strobe, strobe lights um, that really impact me. So I think there was an installation at a gallery that had um, that had a neon light um, blinking, and and that's fine. However, um, there was also an artist talk happening in the same space, so the artist talk I had to leave because I I couldn't be under the environment of the strobe light um, for for an extended period of time to be able to listen to the artist talk. Um, so that was one situation where where it wasn't you know, it, it was not the best. It was, it was an unfortunate situation for me. 
Um, however, let's see, in, in, other, um, in other experiences, I can think about, um, I've, uh, oh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. What I was talking about transportation, and that was one of the things that um, made me feel very welcome here in Winnipeg when I first uh, started working in Winnipeg, um, in having a disability, having that the inability to drive um, to get to, to events and being offered uh, not just a ride, but community members went out of their way to go pick me up and bring me to an event. Um, and at the time I had just moved to Winnipeg, I was not very sort of unfamiliar and with my disability, I couldn't, there was no way I was gonna take the bus for you know an hour and a half to go to an event. Um, so, so those are situations where where people man, people helped me out, and and it was it made it really accessible for me. Great, thanks, Adriana. And since we have two minutes left, we can get that last question in from for Jordan from Jim McDermott. So Jim McDermott asks regarding hearing performances with ASL hearing interpreters off stage. Um, you ever? Do the ASL DI off stage or can be on stage with hearing actors? He has the, the question in the chat if you wanted to um, to take a look. I'm having a bit of a hard time translating that one. But I'm going to spotlight Jordan and Jordan, go ahead and uh, answer the question. Well, there are interp interpreters on stage and off stage for various reasons. Uh, sometimes you'll have some for backstage in terms of communication between the performers. So you may have, um, you know, the stage manager and whatnot that needs interpretation. But in terms of, I assume what your your meaning is for performances. So, um, yeah, sorry. So let me just uh, back up a second. So when, when I was in, involved in the Free Penny Opera, we did have deaf performers on stage. So I was one of the performers, uh, along with a hearing actor, a voice actor. So some, some interpretation happened off stage as well as on stage. So we did have a deaf interpreter there, but it was nice to have more of the, the DI in, as a part of the performance, which was quite amazing. And then you'll what you're getting is that first language uh, coming from a first language user. And so I find that that's an imperative or certainly an important thing to have available. Thank you for the question. I've done it again. <laughs> okay, well, that takes us right to eight o'clock. So I would like to thank so much Cheryl Bronzett, Adriana Alcon, Jordan Sanglang for this great uh, discussion and talk on accessibility in the arts. Um, I learned something and I know quite a bit about the subject, so that was wonderful. Um, I'd like to invite Aurelia and Rachel to turn on in the videos if they would like to say goodbye to everyone and thank you so much for attending. And I hope you guys can all make the next one on uh, June 12th. And just as a reminder, this Thursday, is uh, the Manitoba Culture Society of the Deaf is having the magic of ASL plus LSQ for free uh, on a Zoom event. So please attend if you can, it should be wonderful. There's gonna be performers from across Canada, uh, deaf performers across Canada um, doing some presentations. So yeah, thank you all again. And Rachel, Alia, is there anything you guys would like to add? Just thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I've learned so much. I can't even tell you. Uh, it makes me feel like I would like to learn some ASL just so that I feel a part of it. Thank you so much for all your honesty and sharing all your stories. Yes, I'm going to rewatch this recording. Yeah. <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> this is very informative. Thank Great. you. Well, thank you everyone. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you uh, on June 12th at 1 p.m. on Saturday for the next, uh, next workshop. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.